Well, uh, good Friday morning to everyone and welcome to History Matters. And so does coffee a few minutes late because we got way too engaged in a conversation about glasses. So my apologies if you've been hovering, waiting for this to begin, but we are beginning now. Um, and as I said um, yesterday, oops, let me once again close chat because then I will forget what I'm supposed to be saying. There we go. Um, what I did tweet out yesterday always takes me a while to figure out what I want to talk about. And today's topic was a product of several different things that have been happening recently. And then one thing that appeared to take up a lot of space <laughs> on Twitter yesterday, which it's all related. Uh, and particularly given that there are a lot of people here on History Matters who are teachers, um, this seemed like a particularly useful topic to have. So what I am going to be talking about today is really the teaching of history. What are we doing when we're teaching history? What should we be doing? Um, what should we not be doing? Uh, for those of you who didn't catch that Twitter conversation, I'll mention it and you can seek it out. Um, it, it was all over. It was like all kinds of historians weighing in with very strong feelings for understandable reasons. But before I get into that, let me turn to my partner in crime, Annie, uh, to offer the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Evans with New American History, and we are delighted to have everybody here this morning. We already have a very robust discussion about glasses and other topics going on in the chat this morning, as we always do. We encourage you to say who you are, where you're from. If you're new this week, we love to know when people are new so we can welcome them. Um, so the chat is great and it's part of our community and we've built that community up over the 124 episodes. But if you have questions while Joanne starts speaking on her topic this morning, um, please put those questions that you specifically want her to address towards the end of the talk in the Q&A. That is where we will look for only that place that we will look for the questions. Um, John wanted me to remind everybody that the NCHE Summit is coming up on September 24th. Uh, if you subscribe to the newsletter, you've already got that information as a reminder yesterday. If not, it's on uh, nchteach.org. And I encourage you guys to sign up for that. All right, I think we're ready. Excellent, okay. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, um, there were a number of things that, that led to my deciding to approach this topic. Um, on the negative side, <clears throat> and somehow it's easy to feel that side these days uh, as far as teaching history. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I believe there began to leak out news about um, new history standards uh, being used in Florida, uh, teaching things like uh, the founders never intended a separation of church and state. They'd be surprised at that. Um, and I looked at that and they're upsetting for any number of reasons, in addition to being blatantly wrong. Um, but so there was uh, one obvious um, political politics driven um, warping of history. Um, then right after that, also in Florida, sorry, Florida, but what's happening in your state? Um, DeSantis uh, decided that, you know, because there's a teacher shortage, uh, that veterans with no teaching experience can now become teachers. Because how great is that? That you know they're worthwhile people. They're veterans, and thus they should be easily able to just go into a classroom and teach. Which um, I'm not even going to go into what that makes me feel. But again, uh, that's not necessarily history focused, and yet it's much the same topic. Then there was um, the essay in. Uh, an essay written by, um, I guess, the new president of the AHA uh, about, I didn't, I made the mistake of not dotting the title down, but what it's about is presentism in uh, writing, I guess, not explicitly teaching, but certainly writing uh, history in historical scholarship, the way that we address history. And it was very much um, naysaying uh, and, and kind of attacking presentism, although we're going to talk in a minute about what that means, um, because I don't think it's clear, he's clear about what he means, um, but it was attacking presentism in a variety of different ways in history um, and suggesting, you know, on the one hand, talking about advocacy, but also talking about focusing on modern history and not on earlier history. We'll come back to that momentarily, but it was um, a very strongly stated essay um, pretty explicitly saying that, you know, we hinting, let me put it this way, that some of the ways in which we address 
race and gender might be more driven by contemporary questions than questions that one ought to be making of historical subjects. I'm not stating this as my point of view. I'm stating this as the essay's point of view. Anyway, this, um, for a lot of reasons, provoked a huge response. Uh, and uh, if you go on Twitter and uh, put in AHA and presentism, you will see the vast discussion that this launched. And I'm sure that there will be essays and more things coming out about that because this is the president of the AHA at a moment when history as a subject to study and the teaching and writing of history um, are under attack in any variety of ways, just the idea of what our history as a nation is all under attack. So it's an interesting time for that essay. Um, and uh, we'll come back to that momentarily, but all of these things together, all on the negative side, plus one thing on the positive side, and that is, and someone I know already tweeted the link, but there's a New York Times um, interactive essay on teaching history in the classroom that has our very own Kara Lee as one of the, the main speakers. I guess there's four people speaking maybe, or five, four. Anyway, Kara Lee, there she is being an excellent history teacher. Um, so first of all, that's right, Kara Lee's star moment. I applaud Kara Lee. Um, I also applaud the New York Times. That was an actually an interesting, uh, thoughtful way to open a subject at least. Um, but I really applaud uh, a member of our own community, Kara Lee, uh, for taking part in that. Uh, and that finally, the last thing was like, okay, now we're talking about this because it keeps coming back and hitting me in the face. And it's important to talk about. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about what are we doing when we're teaching history or what should we be doing or what should we not be doing? Um, and you know, one point, I, I, although much of this discussion is going to be anchored in the present, I do want to make a point about the past, um, only because, well, you'll see, it, it's so directly related. In some ways, this discussion about presentism and advocacy history um, is suggesting, not everyone who's talking about it or writing about it, but some are suggesting that this is a very present, it's, it's a problem of now, of the here and now. Um, and of course, um, that's a presentist way of thinking. <laughs> it really is. Because uh, you could go back in time, obviously, and find any number of ways in which times and places and peoples have done very similar kinds of things with history for their own various purposes. And even, you know, go back to the founding, which you have to say in that tone of voice, um, you know, the founding period, smack in the middle of the Enlightenment, their view, generally speaking, uh, of history was that it was a, a big grab bag of uh, events and people and ideas and that you could be in the present, and pick and choose from the big grab bag of history and determine the grand patterns of society or of politics or whatever and apply those grand plans, those grand theories, those big ideas and patterns and then better control and deal with the present, right? So it, by, it, by definition, the pe many people who are thinking about history in the founding era are thinking about it very specifically as a tool for the present. Uh, and some of them were unabashedly um, editing it and warping it, one might say to use a modern word, to uh, fall in line with what they thought was correct. Again, um, part of the sort of enlightenment mode of thinking that there are patterns, there are universal patterns, you look for them, you find them, you apply them, and you can make the present better. Thomas Jefferson, when he was talking about um, the curriculum at the University of Virginia, he's very interested in the writings of Hume, David Hume. Uh, but he says a number of times, like, you know, the correct version of Hume, you know, he needs to be corrected. In other words, uh, edited, <laughs> amended, so that the real history could come out and the bad history can be taken out of it. And, you know, that's of that moment, this idea that um, history is a grab bag to be used, as opposed to uh, the idea that the current day article on presentism suggests, which is, um, we need to always be entirely removed and step back and not allow the present to impose itself on the past when we analyze the past. Now, there are um, a lot of 
I have a lot of questions about that. Um, the foremost one being, and this is coming from someone, and those of you who have been here, and I should say 124th, episode 124, which I forgot to say earlier. Those of you who've been here for some of those 123 episodes certainly know that a, a big part of the kind of history that I practice, the, the kind of research that I do, the kind of writings that I do, are very much focused on trying to be, trying to look through as best I can, because I can't, uh, through the eyes of the people I'm looking at in the past, using the words they choose, using patterns of, of speech and action to try and figure out, to try and at least begin to understand how they're looking newbie. <laughs> Please, how they're how they understand looking ahead in time, how they're what their mental landscape might look like in some way versus what we impose looking back in time at the past, right? So that's what I do all the time. Now that said, it is not really, not only is it not possible for us to look at the past entirely stripped of the present, but being in the present moment more often than not leads you to new questions or new insights or new ways of putting things together that are going to lead you to new findings and ideas. So I, I don't think it's absolutely possible to strip the present out of the way that we look at the past. It just isn't. And um, even as I say, I'm trying to look through the eyes of my characters as best I can, I will readily acknowledge that the, the things I'm looking for or the way that I'm looking for them or the wording that I use, although I focus, words matter, I focus a lot on the vocabulary that people use, but still, um, certainly, uh, my present and our current day shapes what I'm looking for and shapes in a more general way the topics that historians are interested in. Um, that said, another aspect of this essay talks about presentism. And in that sense, they're talking about the, actually sometimes using the word advocacy, right? So in some sense, presentism and again, part of the issue with that essay, I think, is that presentism means a hundred different things, or at least five, uh, and it's unclear uh, at any one time what it means. But at certain points in the essay, it reads as though um, the, the problem that's being addressed is advocacy, politically driven history. Now, that's a big there's a big spectrum, right? If if by politically driven history, you mean addressing questions of race or gender uh, and putting them in the foreground in a way that they weren't foregrounded in the past, that to me isn't presentism. That's focusing <laughs> on something specific that needs to be addressed and actually that hasn't been addressed as as it should have been in the past. There are historians who step forward and say, um, you know, by emphasizing these issues in the past when people thought about them differently, uh, that we're imposing present day standards on the past and it's not fair. You know, this connects to a larger issue about, you know, how we judge figures in the past. Uh, and the argument that many people make, you know, this person, well, it was a person, we should judge them by the standards of their time. Well, first of all, we should start out not by judging, but by looking and figuring out what they're doing. And even in the context of their time, there's going to be more subtlety and more variation than one might allow. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but but a great example, when you look this up, when you play around with the idea of presentism and, and Google around to see what others are saying about it, obviously Thomas Jefferson, whoop, front and center, because there he is, the, the sort of, you know, poet of the founding era, right? He comes forth with these words that seem to capture something about the ethos of the time for some. And then there's Jefferson, the slaveholder, uh, who enslaves people, who has a lot to say uh, about Black people of any kind, right? There's a clearly racist Jefferson, and what do you do with both of those? And some people say, well, you know, he was a man of his time. Well, that's a, that's a smooth kind of a statement that um, 
masks the fact that there were people in his time <laughs> who were much more enlightened than he was. So yeah, there were, there were people who felt like he did. There were others who didn't. And to say that he was of his time, in a way, it is a way of not really delving in to the issue. Um, I am not necessarily saying we need to um, look back and uh, scream in outrage. Some people certainly can do that. I'm saying as historians, we certainly need to look at what they're doing, see what they're doing, really look at it in the context of its time. Not everyone was doing what he was doing and acknowledge that was his view. And, and he, there are big issues in the way that he thought about slavery in what he did or specifically didn't do when it came to the people he himself enslaved. At the same time, there are the kind of timeless words that were included in the Declaration of Independence. And many people, uh, when addressing this problem with Jefferson, will say, you know, the Declaration, these timeless words about people being created equal. Well, yes. But the, their, their use as freeing words, um, th that happened later, right? Largely in the 19th century by people who used those words, people who were being marginalized or suppressed or repressed in various ways, used those words to demand rights, to demand their presence, to assert themselves. So in that sense, yeah, okay, Jefferson offered principles that have had a huge impact on American history, but the huge impact is largely because of people who understood the power of those words and deployed them to promote themselves. You know, it's it's logical, but it's also wonderful that um, what a tool, right? If, if you are being um, marginalized in some way and you step forward and say, well, this is your, this is, you know, this is your founding document and it says X, Y, and Z. So seems to me, <laughs> dot, 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 right? That's, that's powerful. And you see a lot of that in the 19th century. So you know, I'm mixing a lot of things in there, but part of what I'm trying to say is, yes, he wrote the great words. Yes, the great words matter. No, he's not responsible for the way in which they were used by others to expand horizons and open opportunities. And yes, he deserves to be looked at as a slaveholder um, who may have spoken against slavery, but didn't do everything he could do against slavery and was not, um, typical necessarily it was of a kind of person in that time period. And rather than trying to make a scale, was he better or worse than other people to really look at what he was doing and what it meant. So, you know, presentism in, in many ways, that's one is problematic. I think another way that this attack on um, presentism is interesting. And I thought about it a lot, haven't thought it through fully. So I was kind of hoping that we could address that here. You know, every, for 124 weeks, we've been meeting here on Friday mornings uh, and addressing history and in one way or another democracy. That's what we've been doing. Um, and I undertook this in the first place because it very much felt to me like a moment when we really need to understand the path that led us to where we are, the patterns of the past that might help us better understand some of the patterns in the present. And so I'm I'm very aggressively, and right now in my work, in my writing, in my speaking, um, in this webcast, in my podcast, someone just got bingo there, I know. Um, I'm very focused on democracy. I'm very focused on defending democracy, defining democracy, um, making it something real that people will understand rather than some ethereal idea that people are always talking about and thus no one is listening to uh, ideas about it. So, you know, am I, would you call that advocacy? Would you call that presentist? You might, I mean, it's very much coming from the present moment, um, but I'm looking to the past for patterns and ideas to help interpret the present, right? And I do that almost every week. This is how these things acted out in the past and these are the kinds of questions they had what kind of questions might we have? How, you know, here's an example of how words really mattered in the past. Let's look at how words matter in the present. That to me, to me, uh, isn't advocacy history. It's doing one of the things that history can do, right? It can offer context. It can offer patterns. It can offer pathways of how we got to the present, even though the the uh, precise definition of those pathways might sort of, we, we could contest those. And that's 
part of the project of history, right? Is is debating and contesting and, and seeking new evidence and finding explanations and seeing if they hold weight, right? This is this is part of what historians do. Evidence, find evidence, seek evidence, interpret evidence, and then debate uh, what it means. So anyway, all of this is a very long way of saying, um, obviously, the, the ultimate understatement is to say that um, in this moment of time, uh, the understanding of history, the teaching of history, approaches to history are are profoundly important, profoundly important for the preservation of the American democratic republic, for, for the, the, the essentially state of our nation. Um, but even on a more specific level, important at a time when uh, the study of history is being questioned, why do we need it? When the liberal arts are being questioned, why do we need them? When teachers of history are being reined in and attacked and accused of things, with buzzwords and ideas that don't necessarily apply to what they're doing when there's book bannings. They're, one of the responses to um, the article, uh, and actually I very badly, bad historian me did not, uh, I did not indicate, I copied the quote and did not copy where it came from. And I apologize for that. Um, at any rate, you can look it up and you will find it out for me. Um, this person said, um, just to be clear, the leading U.S. history organization responds to book bannings, teacher firings, curriculum censoring, and Supreme Court rulings that badly misuse history by telling scholars to retreat to obscure subject matter with no contemporary relevance to avoid the appearance of presentism. Now, I don't think that's quite what that article was saying, but the larger idea that at this particular moment in time, the concern is presentism. That larger idea, I think, is valid. Really? Is that is that is that what we should be addressing right now out of the many things that we can address is, should we be bringing the present into the way we understand history? I don't think that's a, qu a question because I think we do it no matter what. Um, if you wanna talk about advocacy and history, we can certainly do that. Um, you know, and I'm not going to say that every single possible way that you're being presentist uh, in looking at history necessarily um, works as well as every other way or that I might grant credibility to every kind of history of that mode equally. That said, yeah, we do have to ask questions and um, look at things that maybe weren't seen as important in the time, th that were dismissed at the time, profoundly misunderstood at the time, undervalued at the time, populations that historians have undervalued and not looked at. All of these things you could say are imposing present questions, present standards, even present judgments on the past, that's how you continue to learn from the past. You ask new questions. And many of those questions by definition are going to come from the times you're living through. That's, you know, grad students learn that immediately in grad school when they're looking at the historiography of whatever it is they're looking at. You're looking at how historians over time have approached a given topic based on the time they were in. Right? So, of course, in the 1960s, historians were more interested in, you know, common people than elites. And they began trying to get a sense of, you know, what the average American was doing as opposed to presidents and elite leaders. Of course, it's the 1960s, right? So there are all kinds of ways in which the present shapes our thinking about the past. Um, and I, I think that's a big topic. And I do think that that essay had some problematic generalizations. Um, I'll be interested to see what happens because there was such a big response to it. It almost feels as though there needs to be um, a response to the response, which could be a, a really useful conversation, depending on how it's approached. Um, I will offer one quote before I stop here um, from the article, because I don't want to do what, well, I, I'll stop myself there. I don't want to um, talk about the article without at least giving you a sense of it. Um, so this is, is one passage from it. I think I'll offer this one paragraph. Um, okay. Um, if we don't read the past through the prism of contemporary social justice issues, race, gender, sexuality, nationalism, capitalism, are we doing history that matters? This new history, the presentist history, often ignores the values and uh, of people in their own times, as well as change over time, neutralizing the expertise that separates historians from those in other disciplines. 
The allure of political relevance facilitated by social and other media encourages a predictable sameness of the present in the past. This sameness is ahistorical, a proposition that might be acceptable if it produced positive political results, but it doesn't. Um, that's a strong statement there. Um, that, you know, somehow or other what's being claimed is that if you don't address race, gender, sexuality, nationalism, or capitalism, that somehow people who are focused on concerns of social justice in the present are saying it doesn't count as history. I don't know if that's true either. So there, there are a lot of generalizations being tossed around here. Makes sense that they're being tossed around at a moment when, I'm going to use yet another word that some, I'm going to give somebody bingo, are so fraught, right? When things are so fraught, politics... Uh, the state of our government, the state of our nation, um, what's going to happen six months down the road, never mind two years down the road. Um, all of these things are so immediate and so pressing uh, and so important for us to consider. It makes sense that uh, thinking about history has a sense of urgency too. And it makes sense that some people are responding to that sense of urgency in a strong kind of a way. I think I guess I would say overall, as I want to conclude my comments here so that we can really open the discussion. Um, if the larger question of today's episode is, you know, what should we be doing when we're teaching history? Of course, we should be teaching accurately about what happened in the past, teaching in its full complexity, good and bad. The mug will come up in a moment. Um, that we should be uh, not hiding from things that you know, look bad or suggest that some people in the past were bad and thus is somehow suggesting people in the present related to them are bad, that all of these ways in which some people are saying we need to hide uh, from uncomfortable parts of the past, that's obviously not what we should be doing. We should be really engaging uh, with students to ask questions, to look at evidence, to evaluate things, to see things they didn't see before, um, to judge for themselves in some ways how things add up or don't add up. Um, it's another part of this, and I won't go into it because I'm running out of time, but um, what's not brought into all of these discussions about what should happen in the classroom is the fact that the students have questions. The students want to address things. The students understand all of the things that are going on around them, and they want to understand them better, and they want historical context, and to pretend like somehow or other um, the present doesn't exist and thus the questions about the past that they might have don't matter, That that's also, I think, problematic. So at any rate, uh, to say that teaching history matters is the most profound understatement, um, but it does particularly now. And that's why in some ways it's under attack. That's why in some ways history teachers are under attack. They wouldn't be under attack if it wasn't so important. It's vitally important. And so um, I salute, I know that there are so many uh, educators here. Uh, I will conclude by just um, saluting all of you educators out there because you're, you're doing the work. Like you're, you're doing, you're walking the walk, right? You're doing the important work. And it's in a sense, perhaps more important now than it has ever been as far as in the larger context um, of American history and where we're headed. Um, I will stop there. I know many of you have already been saying, um, mug, 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 mug. This, in a sense, this is really obvious, but I couldn't, it's the best mug for this discussion. Um, so it will not be a surprise in any way. History should make you uncomfortable. Now, is it, I, I'm so bad, Tim or Tom? Tom, there you go, Tom, okay. Thank you, Tom. It is your mug again. I know, and it was recent. Um, this is a really, this, this mug, Tom, this, is, this speaks to the moment, um, but very specifically it speaks to this topic, um, which is that's precisely what should happen when you're thinking about teaching, writing about history. Okay, I will now stop and we can open things up. Perfect mug. Um, my <laughs> mug is, someone asked in the chat, this is one, this has been around for a while. It's got a quote from Joanne on the back and um, it, has, it has all of our hashtags basically. <laughs> History mugs, history matters, yay history. <laughs> I like this one because it's really heavy. It's got a good handle. I'm a mug snob now because of y'all. <laughs> it, is, it is. It is a fine feeling to have a big, yep. nice big. 
heavy. A big mug. It has, it can, I hate those little teeny ones. Okay, we've got lots of great questions. So we're going to jump right in. And I will uh, say, I, I hope this will be a real discussion since what I'm talking about here is what you, many of you are smack in the middle of. So I, you know, as I was doing this, I was like, I want to like be here and be saying, let me tell you about teaching uh, history. I, I want us to really be able to talk about it. I know if, I, if, if we had thought of it, we could have had John promote the teachers in the group to panelists. Uh, like you did at your conference. We should maybe do that another time. Okay. Yes. Maybe we do that at the conference, John. Okay. So Dave is asking, what can parents of children stuck in a bad history class with a bad history teacher do to remedy that problem? Would the fix be different for K-5, middle or high school? Um, and he notes that Kara Lee's son, two years in a row, got a pretty weak history teacher. Now imagine that being Kara Lee's kid's history teacher. <laughs> No pressure there, but yeah. even so, when you get that dud, uh, Dave's asking, what can parents do at different grade levels? Well, before I plunge into my thoughts, that's that's a great example of a question that I want to know yeah. what those right. of you who are teachers think yeah. can or could happen. Like this, this is a great, you know, moment for you to chime in. Um, what do you do? You know, what do you do when you, a history teacher, uh, have a kid who goes to class and you know that the class is weak. Um, okay, Carolee says be proactive, find out the right person to complain to. Proactive is good. And complain with evidence, she said. But yes, evidence, because we're talking about history. Um, be realistic. What is that? What I, I want to know, Carolee, what you mean by that. Be realistic. And oh, listen to your kid. Mm -hmm. um, they might not be able to move your kid, yeah. right? So there's the reality factor, which is maybe nothing can happen. Yeah. You know, go ahead. When I was a department chair, when you had a weak teacher, every everybody would request their kid get out of there. Where well, you you can't overcrowd everybody else's class because that. But to me, if if consistently year after year you have fifty parents calling demanding their kid be taken out of that class, you've got a staffing issue. You either work with that teacher to make them a better teacher. Or, or you suggest that teacher that perhaps another field might be a better fit for them, but you don't just keep leaving them in there. I mean, and Ellen asks a good question too. Like what, what does it mean to have a dud teacher? And that can mean any number of things. It can mean really teaching bad history or yeah. it could just be someone who's not a great teacher. And those are two different issues, right? right. They're both not great. <laughs> They're both not great. <laughs> and we unfortunately have people that fall into both categories. And the, the thing, here's the thing I don't get all these parents who are saying, you know, I want to get rid of all these woke teachers. Now we're seeing, like you said, Joanne, in Florida, we've got very unqualified people now. We have a huge shortage um, because of the low pay and the lack of respect and the terrible conditions our teachers have been under. And now they're just going to stick random people in there that know nothing. If, if the parents thought they had it bad, imagine what a random person's going to say this year to your kids. Lord knows what will come out of their mouths. So this is going to make it worse, I think. And, and this is what Gloria, you wish for. Gloria asked a version of this, which is what is a weak history teacher. And, and I do think that's part of what we're addressing here, which is, um, first of all, just a bad, a weak teacher, yeah. right? Who, um, in a sense, doesn't teach. She says, here, you know, take these things and go write something. Um, you know, who, who actually isn't doing the teaching, but it's just kind of in the space. Then which, you know, um, <laughs> I don't need to say that teaching is a craft, but <laughs> that's a great example of how it is. But another another weak history teacher is someone who um, can't address the complexities of the past or won't field questions or will declare students wrong without discussing why or how, right? There are any number of things that we could think about that are not going to foster an open, healthy classroom that, that's going to encourage students to learn. Obviously, also related to your question, Gloria, there are different levels and degrees of weak. Um, but if you have someone who's teaching incorrect history, like really aggressively incorrect history, um, or is not teaching, uh, those are both things, you know, I even I don't have kids if I did and I had a kid in a class and they were coming home and telling me things that were like inherently problematic about history. Um, I wouldn't be able to just sit back right I would I would probably want to 
collect evidence, as someone just said. I, I, I Carolee said, find out who's in charge. Once I had a real sense of what was going on, yeah, I might go and talk to someone. And you're right. I think Carolee also said, you don't want to embarrass your kids. So it's not as though I would be like, and another thing, you know, in front of the school. <laughs> but, you know, um, th this is true. It's not just true of history. We are speaking here as history teachers and consumers. Um, but this is true of anything, right? What do you do with a really bad teacher? And you're right, Annie, the point that you just made, um, it, it, I mean, I suppose a school and a district need to know that there's a problem with a teacher, but you can't, you know, take everybody out of that yeah. class. My, my niece uh, one year called me and said, Aunt Annie, can you put three of your business cards in an envelope and send them tomorrow? And I was like, okay. <laughs> she took them to her friend. She took one to her history teacher and she had two friends that didn't like the class they were in and said, this is Aunt Annie. You need to contact her. She might be able to help you. Ooh. Ooh. And one of them did. Two of them, I don't think, knew quite how to respond. But um, it was. And what did that one person? How did that? She, she actually said, like, I have your niece in my class and I know things aren't going well and I know I need help. So if you can help me. So I, I gave her some suggestions. I told her, here's the feedback I'm getting from the kids. I'm hearing it. From the kids right <laughs> here's a here's how your students are experiencing on the other end um but it makes me sad that there wasn't an administrator or a mentor in the building who could have done that and that's part of it too when you say your kid got a bad teacher one question to ask is do they have a mentor especially if they're a brand new teacher or what kind of support is there for teachers that know things aren't going well and want to improve so we can't always put it all on the teacher unless like you said joanne they're teaching wrong facts and they know they're teaching the wrong facts that's a whole different case but if you're just not a great teacher sometimes we can improve that teacher and save that teacher and make them but, of course the flip side to that is teaching in a district or a state where they're declaring you're not allowed to say or do certain things yes you're setting which, them up for failure right exactly which which in and of itself like you can't talk about race and slavery in your classrooms that's a problem yeah like, but you have to teach the civil war that's <laughs> right it's it's compelling that teacher forcing them to teach what one might declare, you know, bad history, like partial history and, then, and that partial history, shaving away all of the things that might make you uncomfortable. Um, yeah. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. And, and that's, you know, that's teaching, that's not teaching American history, that's teaching a particular viewpoint um, and what they want to be true and not true about American history. But so that's, a, that's and that's where we are. That's part of why um, I wanted to link up the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic with K through 12 educators, particularly secondary school educators, because I don't I don't know if um, the the sort of pro college professors have a real sense of what's going on on the secondary school level, and the secondary school teachers really, really, really need support from college professors who can step forward and say, you know, I'm I'm an expert on this subject, and let me tell you, if you're teaching X as this, the teacher wants to do X, that's actually accurate. If you're preventing them from saying X, yeah. that's a problem, right? Yeah, Gloria, Gloria just put something similar to that in the chat. You know, we're experiencing a big war right now in Virginia with our standards revisions, like wow. Texas and so many other states. And that keeps coming up. Um, the need, and that's why when you had your panel at your conference, so many of us, you know, we were watching the video that day while you were at the um, Shear conference, and we were cheering, you know, the night before you had that panel and you're tweeting about it. Um, that meant so much to those of us who are in the K-12 world to, for you to say, you're gonna sit and listen to these K-12 teachers and we're gonna have a discussion at your professional conference. That was- Which, which I want to happen every year. I can't control that, but yeah. I, I'm definitely making, bec just because it's so, it just feels so important to me and particularly yeah. at this moment, right? How exactly. can we not be together at exactly. this and we have a teacher question in the Q&A. So this is a perfect transition to that question. This is coming from our friend, Jean, who's been with us for a long time. She says, I know she knows how much our group loves using primary sources. She says she did not teach that way. The Florida teacher that spoke to MSNBC's uh, Alex Wagner on a segment this week about the history teacher training workshop said the training promoted using primary sources. So Jean's question is, is it possible to cherry pick primary sources to support your viewpoint? 
She says, this teacher saw a definite Christian slanted view of history in her training or in the training. Yes, it is definitely possible to cherry pick, right? Well, we just saw Supreme Court justices do the same thing, right? Um, you can you can you can cherry pick facts, you can cherry pick history, you can cherry pick quotes and documents. You certainly can. I mean, and this is, I know many of you already, you're right, Carolee, you can cherry pick anything. Totally. This is part of what um I try to teach my undergrads, right? When they're writing a research paper, doing their own research, is if you go into a project looking to prove something, you will be able to do that because you'll be able to find sentences or statements that say what you want them to say. They will not necessarily be representative of what people think, of what's going on, or even of any degree of accuracy. So don't go into a project assuming that, well, of course, of course, I will find this kind of statement about Christianity. I must find it. It's what I know is there. You'll find some. But if you address the evidence and read and see primary sources and look at the sources that conflict, right? That's the that's the great part is, and I always, I know I'm always preaching about using primary sources because in, in one way or another, it can get us past textbooks, um, but you're totally right. You can cherry pick them. So addressing the, the conflict and the contingency, someone else just got bingo, um, in these documents, using them with integrity, as opposed to cherry picking to make a very specific point, you know, all of these, in a way, we're talking about spectrums of teaching here. And yet, as we're talking, it, we, we, we can see how easy it is to drive things in a very specific way and claim primary sources. Look, it's the sources, it's the evidence. I'm just saying what they say and make it hard for people to refute. Again, this, is, this seems like another one of those cases when bringing history educators of all kinds, secondary and college together, makes it easier to confront that kind of thing because you know someone can step forward and say yeah you're right that there's that document and that says this however there are 192 other documents <laughs> you know like that's an outlier like that's just not what was representative of the period and I can talk about that with evidence and I can seems like we we, we I don't know we need to we need to have each other's back very specifically for that and that's hard because I can't say you know yeah that's bad and here's how you fix it that's hard. How do you stop that kind of cherry picking? I mean, Supreme Court didn't seem to have a problem with it. So, right. So, so I'm um, I'm taking executive privilege and I'm prioritizing the teachers this week in the Q and A over others. We love the rest of you, but I am putting the teachers at the head of the class. Um, Jean had a follow up. It says it seems like the attack on history teaching is part of a long standing attack on teaching in general. Do we teach information or do we teach children how to think for themselves? There's a segment of the society that doesn't want children taught how to think for themselves. I mean, that's a that's a bigger problem with education, right? That it's not just history, and that's true. Um, you know, the the this is not directly growing from that, but it's related. One of the things that I always think is. Um, most ironic about some of the people arguing about what's actually going on in classrooms, which isn't, is the idea that somehow um, there are people uh, who are absolutely imposing, you know, a, a view on students and that they will absorb this view and will never think beyond it um, and, and can't do anything outside of it. And then, you know, very often people respond and say, I can't get my students to read the syllabus. <laughs> I'm going to be able to impose but you're absolutely right that there are some people who want to have that kind of a, you know, straight and narrow view of things. A again, a, you know, a, a good teacher wants students to question, right? That's, that's how they're learning. We, and, and we, you know, those, all of us here who are teachers, we all have seen, I think we talked about this in a recent week. We've all, you've seen that moment when you're teaching something and then you can see on students' faces that they get it. Right, you can see that, that that they they get it not like oh that's an interesting fact, but that suddenly something connected, and they're thinking differently. Right, they're putting pieces together in a different way. You know, that's clearly what we should be doing. So you know, Gloria's earlier question, what's a, what's a weak history teacher? It's a good question only because the sort of stuff we're talking about now, as easy as it seems to answer that question, it could be difficult to answer that question because 
it's so amorphous in some ways. But um, and yes, Gloria's saying, "Yay, teach them to question." That you know, I I think back to um, the history classes I had over the course of my life, even just before grad school. I was not a history major in college. I was an English major in college um, because I didn't want, <laughs> this is a horrible thing to say in this conversation. <laughs> I loved history so much and I loved primary sources so much that I was afraid that if I took a real history course, they would teach me to do history in a way that made it not fun anymore. So I hid from history classes. I didn't take history classes because I wanted to keep history and didn't want anyone to take it away from me, which tells you something, but in secondary school, I certainly took, you know, history, and, 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 you know, I remember seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, I still remember those teachers, you know, I remember what they did, I remember what they taught, the good ones, um, the ones that were not so good, I don't, um, but the ones that were good, you know, they surprised you, and they confronted you with things, and they, they were there present in person, right, that's another thing that isn't related to the topic, but being there yourself in an authentic kind of a way so that students can see how you're engaged with what you're doing. Those are the teachers I remember too. Wow. So um, we all know how important a good teacher can be. And we all know how important a good history teacher can be. Um, and what we're talking about here in one way or another this morning is all of the ways in which you can try and get around those things. Right, you can shortcut those things or strip away those things, and you know this is a, a way in which I don't. I one of many topics in which I feel like I don't have the answer to this, but that I think it's so important for us to acknowledge this this sort of history war that's happening, and the fact that we need to stand up for actual history. Yeah, I'm going to combine two different teachers' questions. We've got Ellen who's with us and she's participating in the chat. She's a teacher and also Kathleen. So Ellen uh, is asking, are there other points in our nation's history, maybe the Cold War with the fear of communist leaning teachers or loyalty oaths, um, or Kathleen is talking about, you know, are we um, at this point now where we're putting teachers on the defense here um, and everything is, you know, disparaging teachers. So do you have any thoughts on that? Or have we seen this before? And how do we get out of it in other periods of history? Have we seen in other periods? When, um, attacking, yeah, where they're attacking teachers, you know, uh, Ellen's example was the Cold War with, um, you know, accusing them of being communist loyal to loyalists and making people sign loyalty oaths. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, that's kind of what I said at the outset, then in a way to pretend that some of what we're seeing now is only happening now and hasn't happened before. <laughs> It's really present is, um, you know, classrooms are always an epicenter of controversy if you're talking about social change or political change. People will immediately, you know, those with power will immediately go to classrooms uh, and try to shape what's happening there in an effort to shape the future. So classrooms are always that. Um, and educators and actually textbooks, all of these things, traditionally speaking, are always centers of attack in one way or another. And that's because over the centuries, even if you're just talking about American history, people realize and assume whatever you're teaching in the classroom in one way or another is going to shape what people will acknowledge to exist in the future, right? It, it's, it's the power of history, but it's kind of a flip way of looking at it. But yeah, so this always happens. I think one of the distinctive things about the present, and I know I certainly before said, um, history doesn't repeat, um, but it certainly are echoes in one way or another, um, is that what's distinct, one of the distinctive things about the present is the degree to which um, our political system, uh, our just concrete political system, uh, the electoral process, uh, institutions, national institutions of government of various sorts, we're at a moment when a lot of things have been undermined or eroded by people with power who are continuing to undermine and erode. That it's not that that has never happened before, but to this degree by people with this much power in this cohesive and sustained a way, that's a, that's a problem. And so we're at a moment when 
you're talking about how we understand who we are as a country at a moment when there are people really aggressively, not just having disagreements about, you know, what America should be, but really explicitly undermining the political system in some pretty acute ways. That presents a very distinctive kind of a challenge. Again, not the first time that's happened, but there are people in power who are openly saying and doing things uh, in a way that is is pretty shocking and that we all feel all the time, right? That, that, um, that we don't quite know what's gonna happen at any moment. This is an exhausting time to exist and a really exhausting time <laughs> to be a teacher. Um, yes, Stephen says, um, black educators lost significant ground. All kinds of educators um, are losing major, major ground advances, ways in which we became more inclusive in our understanding of things, ways in which people didn't necessarily feel that they had to be defensive all the time about what they were teaching. All of this is on the line. So this isn't the first time to go all the way back to the question. It's not the first time this kind of thing has happened, but in this particular moment, this kind of um, attacking and, and the warfare of history and teachers and history classes has a distinctive kind of uh, dynamic to it and can have a very distinctive kind of impact. And it's, got, it's already having a, a distinctive sort of influence on the profession that I'm not sure will recover, right? Like if we keep pushing people out of that profession, anyway, that's a, a whole other week. It's a whole other conversation, but it's a huge one and we can't necessarily um, address that here, but that's a whole, yeah. That's a whole okay. Thing. I'm gonna take some questions from non-teachers because yes. people are like, hey, wait, there's we're here too. So a couple of people have asked you to actually give a definition of what is presentism. They weren't familiar with that term before you shared. So if you could address that. Um, and I'm gonna kind of combine that's Francesca's question with Dale. He asked, How do the ideas of people who can't agree on the facts of a historical event affect presentism? So if you could define presentism and then how, how do we get these people who can't agree on it? How does that affect presentism? Okay, so I'll give a general definition because I think some of what we're talking about here is this very question, which is how do you define presentism? So um, some might define it as um, using contemporary questions or issues that are very much of the moment and imposing them on the past in some way uh, and not looking at the past, but remaining firmly planted in the present. So some might call that presentism. The, the general description I'll say is in one way or another, using the present very explicitly to find things in the past for present day purposes, right? So people might argue presentism is, um, again, depending on how they view it, um, doing a disservice to the way we understand history because it's just looking through a lens of what we see and do and need now might be a way of understanding. So presentism, meaning the present is everywhere and the past is kind of in the background. Um, I think that that term can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And I think that's part of why um, the uh, article uh, that I began by talking about has, is problematic in some ways because I don't think it explicitly defines presentism. But that's what people mean is, um, not acknowledging the pastness of the past and just looking through a present day lens. Um, and again, there's a spectrum here. So um, I see people talking about the, the, during the app party, we can talk about the games uh, that I discussed uh, yeah. in the podcast. But at any rate, that, that would be one way I define presentism. I, but I think the, the sort of like mushiness, amorphousness of it, um, is, is part of the problem here, right? Is that it has to do with the, how the present influences our understanding of the past, but that can mean a lot of different things. And as I said earlier, um, yeah, my existence here in 2022, looking to the past, um, I'm gonna be interested in specific things. I'm gonna ask specific questions. I'm gonna be not interested in specific things. You could say in a sense, that's presentist, I suppose. I just think I'm living in this time and these are the issues that we're interested in. Um, again, advocacy, you could say people going to the past for purposes of social justice in the present, you could argue that that's presentist, but again, I think it depends on how you're doing it and what you're doing. I don't think, I don't think there are bright lines. I think this is the question of what is presentist has to do partly with motives, intentions, and methods. And I think 
those are all things we need to discuss and you can't simply declare something out of bounds as people are want, seem to want to do at this moment, right? You can't do this, you can't discuss that, you can't use this word, you can't, we all know in education that's not, it's not how education works, right? Education is all about the dividing lines and the complexity and the conflict and the things that don't make sense and all of the edges of things that you, you need to wrestle with before you can really have an understanding of what happened in the past. Yeah. Oh, here we go. So Tim, Miriam Webster, presentism is an attitude toward the past dominated by present day attitudes and experiences. Now you can see how that's pretty broad, <laughs> you know? And if you're applying that to history, um, I think I think I think that question about how do you define it is a really good question, and I think that that's part of why everyone's responding so strongly to that article um, by the president of the AJ, the James Sweet article, uh, is because it's it has to do with values. But what does that mean? Uh, and and because that's that's looped in with some of the you know, buzzword things that people talk about today, you know, wokeism, social justice warriors, all these other things that people who ask certain kinds of questions of the past are then like stamped with that. Oh, you're just a woke historian. It's like, well, no, I'm asking a particular kind of question, you know, and that, that kind of question, it's valid to ask and I'll use evidence and I'll see what happens if I ask it of the past, not necessarily off bounds, right? So, so again, this is a moment when um, partisan views in one way or another are, are hyper complicating these broader questions about the kinds of questions we should be asking of the past uh, and, and attempts by people to prevent us by acknowledging seeing or asking certain things of the past. Yeah. So we have a new uh, community member who put a question in the Q&A. So I, I saw that. I meant to not because I wanted to, I wanted to applaud a new community member. Who is, what is this person? Yeah. Saying? So uh, his name is Adam, and I don't want to uh, mispronounce his last name. I'm sure I will. It's GF, GF Foglioni. I'm sure I just butchered it. I apologize, Adam. But anyway, we have a Slack channel to continue the community throughout the week. So if you're interested, Adam, in joining us offline, if you put your name and your email in the chat, then we can add you to Slack. Um, but Adam's question is, First of all, he says, thanks for doing this. He's joining for the first time. He's and welcome. welcome. Yeah. And he's starting his 16th year of teaching. Yay. Wow. Uh, eighth grade US history. He said, we talk a lot about legacy monuments, cancel culture, et cetera. And it tends to get interesting with figures such as Jefferson and Jackson. Thoughts on navigating this as an educator. I mean, and this is a case in which um, there will be many answers to this in the same way that there are many educators. I do think the fact that we are, that this is a conversation that is very alive right now is in and of itself significant and interesting, right? Uh, in my early National America lecture course, one of the things I've done in the past about Andrew Jackson is list on the board, like six different ways you can define him, right? You know, the... Um, common man president, you know, the genocide president, all of these different things, all of which can be declared to be true of Jackson. And then we talk as a class, we wrestle with that and what it means and what it suggests. Um, to me, I think that it's very explicitly the fact that someone like Jefferson, that it's so hard to wrestle with the different aspects of him show, and, and you can engage students in having it helping them understand why that complexity and why those contradictions, what they show so profoundly about the way we understand the past and the present, that, that you know, you don't have absolute good guys and absolute bad guys uh, in a way that is easy to talk about. You have conflict and complexity and people who might seem good, but actually there's a lot about them that's bad and vice versa. To me, that complexity becomes a real teaching opportunity. Just like, you know, in the past, um, when people would say to me that they, they're they angry because that Hamilton musical is so incorrect about mm -hmm. history, right? And my response is always, what a teaching opportunity. The whole generation of students who are like, wow, this is really interesting and I think X. And for you to be able to step forward and say, actually, more complicated than X, 
but come on in, <laughs> let's talk about it. That, that sometimes just mixing it up so that students understand that we don't know or that you can argue about something that in and of itself. I remember teaching um, my first year of teaching, I think at Yale, my American Revolution course. And I was talking about different ways of understanding um, the Boston massacre. And a, a student, probably, I think a freshman student raised his hand and said, well, which one is true? I was like, well, it depends on the questions you're asking and what you see, right? And I could see the student was like wrestling with the fact that there wasn't one answer. Like that's, that's an excellent start to getting someone to think about how you interpret history and the world around you. So um, we have just a couple more questions. Dale has been very patient, our buddy Dale in Williamsburg. He said, if Jefferson had in fact done everything in his power to end slavery, would he have been marginalized and not able to contribute to the nation's founding? Well, he initially, early in his career, was at least piping up against slavery, and then he decided to pipe down, you know, so it's not as though um, what he did initially, like silenced him and shoved him aside. He didn't very much enjoy and talked about, you know, everyone sort of attacks you and he didn't like that very much and he was kind of conflict averse. Um, it's possible that if he had been a real anti-slavery advocate, um, he might not have been someone who would have been seen as acceptable to be vice president or president. I mean, certainly that could have changed the trajectory of his career, it's possible, um, and even likely in some ways. Um, but, you know, there are other ways in which he might have behaved differently uh, past the time when he was in the height of his career that might not have affected his career in any way at all, but that he could have responded differently. So for example, someone coming forward and saying, I'm gonna move West, I'm gonna take all the enslaved people on my plantation with me and then I'm gonna free them. Um, and could you speak, could you write in favor of my attempt here to do this? It will mean something if you, Thomas Jefferson, step forward and say, I support this. And Jefferson basically said, no, like this is for the next generation. This isn't for our generation. Like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Well, he's a retired ex-president, he could have. Right, he could have said this is a, and he didn't. Um, again, I'm not. I, I don't want to open up a sort of sort of conversation about Jefferson per se, but that's a great example of um, how he could have done something different. Wouldn't necessarily have affected much at all, except maybe he wouldn't have been so loved uh, by the South for preaching state rights, states' rights when the Civil War came along. But at any rate, um, I, I, I think yet another example of. Um, I can't offer necessarily yeses and nos to some of these questions, but that that in and of itself, that point in and of itself is important. Okay, we've got two questions left. We could completely wipe out the Q&A and they're from the same person, so we'll combine them. Um, so this is from S. Peter, so I don't know their first name, so I'm not sure exactly. But anyway, it said, would presentism be at one uh, end of the spectrum with originalists at the opposite? Ooh. Mm. Um, my, my gut response to that is no, um, because originalists, by looking back at a document and saying it only means this, that in and of itself is kind of presentist, right? So like, if you're looking back at the constitution and saying, what the founders thought is all it means. Well, the founders themselves didn't all agree on what it meant and assumed it would change over time. So if you are adopting that kind of a point of view, that's not the ultimate historically accurate view. It, it, in and of itself, it, it's bound up with presentism. So I wouldn't put them on opposite ends of the spectrum. And to me, um, that's a very, um, how do I wanna put it, theory driven, um, way of looking at the Constitution. Um, I, I want it, you know, somehow or other that that makes it objective, right? I think it's part of the goal there is, well, if we just look at it in the con, like what it says, that's it. You know, that's objective. It's not, it's not anything except what the document says, which again, good luck with that because, <laughs> you know, let's argue about what a, a militia means, right? We did that a week or two ago. Um, but still, I, I think um, 
that in and of itself, assuming that uh, there was some general agreement on the meaning of the constitution in the time among all founders, no. And assuming that they assumed it wouldn't change over time, no. So I, I think it's bound up with a different form of presentism. And that was Sandra Peters. She just clarified that. So it was okay. Sandra's question. So we did it. We cleared the Q&A. That doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen very often. No, and we're only 10 minutes late. So that's pretty good yeah, since we spent 10 good. minutes talking about glasses. I know. So um, I uh, want to say a couple of things now at this point. Um, and, and you guys always stick around. When I brag about this community, I'll be like, you know, I talk for half an hour. People ask questions for half an hour. Then many people stick around for another half hour. <laughs> like, these folks are the best, like they're here. Um, at any rate, uh, I thank you. I know that that was a conversation that in some ways was very general. I think that's some of the challenge of talking about presentism. And I think that's some of the challenge in how we're addressing the teaching and researching and understanding history of the present. As ever, um, having this kind of conversation is important because it means that we can actually think about what's happening and think about what is or isn't being imposed or but we or about what we are or aren't imposing. And we have to be aware of that if we're going to address it or respond to it in some way. Um, but broader than that, um, I want to thank you all as ever uh, for meeting here on a Friday morning uh, to essentially engage in democracy, have the kind of conversations that need to happen for a healthy, there it is, for a healthy democracy to survive and flourish. Um, it matters a lot, uh, not just to me and I know to some of you, but uh, in the larger scheme of things, the fact that we are doing this uh, and have been doing it for 124 weeks, um, that that it means something. It may seem small, uh, but it means something. So thank you for doing that. Um, I want you all to have a wonderful week. Now, uh, I know some of you are new. Welcome all new people. And thank you, Adam, for acknowledging that you're new. Perhaps there are others, I don't know. And if you are, you might want to reveal yourself in what we're going to do next. What we are going to do now is um, head off to the after party. What that means is, <laughs> it sounds so exciting. What that means is, I know, woo, is that we're going to stop recording. Right, so that we can be a little freer and easier in our conversation. We can veer off into different topics. It's it's a more casual, sort of chatty form of our community. What that means, if you have beamed in through the NCHE website, stay right where you are, and poof, you will instantly be in the after party. Um, if you are joining us through Facebook, you will need to leave Facebook to join the after party. What that means is leave Facebook and go to nchateach.org slash conversations. And then you will immediately be in the after party too. Um, and ever, as ever, Annie, uh, thank you for being my partner in crime. And I'm so glad you're feeling better. Thank you. That is an excellent and wonderful thing. And congratulations again to Kara Lee for standing out there. Commun Hi, I, I sort of ultimate community member who's out there representing edu history educators. Um, and I will see you all you folks next week. Uh, I might, I might, I, I haven't decided yet. And I, I'll talk about it more in the after party, but it's possible I'm going to try and test out a couple other ways and times of having our conversations, but I haven't figured that out yet. But I'll, I'll stop there uh, and say, for those of you who are leaving now, I'll see you next week. For those who are not, Let's head into the after party. All right. So Sandra Peters, who asked that last